Before we get into today's video, I do wanna let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know y'all are my babies so good morning good morning good morning how is everybody doing today i hope you all are having an amazing day i hope you all have had a wonderful week before we go any further i did want to stop and thank today's sponsor today's video is sponsored by bright sellers bright sellers is a monthly subscription for wines and you guys let me just tell you you go online, first of all, and you take the quiz and they're going to find out what kind of wine you would like by your taste palette, by things you already like. Like, do you like peanut butter cups? Do you like white chocolate? Do you like orange juice? Do you like cranberry juice? It was so cool to do. And when I got my subscription box, you guys, when I opened it up, it was so beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. Yes, aesthetically pleasing. They do such a good job. And I was so excited to try these new wines because I am a very Moscato only type of girl and a plum wine. I do like a plum wine, but I have been wanting to expand my palates with wines. But every time I go out and I order a new type of wine and I don't like it, then I've just wasted $9 and I don't want to try anything new again. So this way with Bright Cellars, I get to try six new wines every single month and they have a delight guarantee policy, which is so amazing. So what happens with that is if you get your six bottles of wine, right? And one of them you decide you you don't like all you have to do is contact bright sellers and the next month when you get your box they're going to send you an extra bottle of wine to replace the one that you didn't like I mean you can't go wrong with that this wine subscription is also very good to give gifts because let me tell you something I know some of y'all been doing homeschool lately and working from home at the same time honey we need a glass of wine at the end of the day okay a glass of wine and a bubble bath lock the door let the children go on. I don't know about y'all, but I know me. <laughs> Anyways, thank you again, Bright Sellers, for sponsoring this video. You guys make sure to go down and click the link below to order your subscription today. All right, back to the video. Now that we got all the good stuff out of the way, let's talk about today's story. Today, we're going to be talking about the Rogers family. Have you guys heard about the Rogers family? and Oba Chandler. Now this Rogers family is not like Mr. Rogers on television. So we're gonna start off with me telling you about Oba Chandler, Oba. I've never heard of anybody named Oba before. Do y'all know an Oba? Do you? Let me know down below. Okay, so Oba was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in October of 1946. He was born to his father who is Oba Senior Chandler and his mother, Margaret Johnson. So obviously by the last names, I guess that they were never married unless she didn't change her last name. Oba also had four other siblings. So their parents had five children together and they all called Oba Chandler Jr. Obi. Now that is super cute, isn't it? Like, Obi! Obi! Sounds like you would be calling a little boy that's like climbing in a tree, throwing rocks down like that. Like, Obi, get down. Okay, anyways. Oba Chandler Jr. always basically got in trouble. I mean, he did not do very good in school when he went to school. He even failed the fourth grade from truancy because he just did not show up. Things really took a turn for Oba when he, whenever he was 10 years old. His dad actually hung himself in their basement and his sister found his body. So that was super traumatic on the whole entire family. It is even said that at the funeral, Oba, while they were lowering his dad down into like the grave, he jumped down into the grave onto the casket while the grave diggers were covering it with dirt and like started jumping up and down on the casket. Like I cannot, that traumatic scene. And his mother was not even at the funeral. She did not show up at his funeral because his father's whole entire family blamed his mother for him hanging himself. So it was all traumatic and drama. Whenever Oba was 14, that's when he started like really getting in trouble with the law. He was stealing cars and breaking into places and fighting people and just 
doing all kinds of stuff. And then when he became an adult, he just continued down that path. He was arrested for money laundering, burglary, assaults. There was even a time that he broke into this couple's house, him and his friend, and they took the couple, they tied the man up, and they took his wife into the next room, stripped her down, did whatever with the man in the other room, and it's just, just terrible, terrible. Now, by the time Oba was 43 years old, he owned an unlicensed aluminum company where he would go around to people's houses and do different work and stuff. And a lot of the customers that, were, that you know, hired him said that he was always shady, would not look them in the eye. He, it just, they just always got a bad vibe from him. Now, at 43 years old as well, it is said that he had 13 different children by 12 different women. Did you hear what I said? 13 different children by 12 different women. Yeah. Now, I also read an article that said it was eight children by seven different women, but then I saw, I've seen them both. We're going to go with the big one because this guy really has been doing the most. Now let's talk about the Rogers family. The Rogers family was a family of a mother and father, which is Hal Rogers and Joan Rogers. She went by Joe and their two daughters who were Michelle and Christy in ages 17 and 14, little teenagers. And they lived in Ohio as well, but also in a very small town, like less than 400 people. And they lived and worked and owned a dairy farm. So their whole entire life was, milking cows, honey, getting cheese, the whole the whole shebang bang. Also on that farm lived Hal's brother, John, and he had like a little trailer over on the side. So everything was really tight knit. Honey, in this small town, everybody was new in everybody's business. Everybody was talking. You got the grandmas and the grandpas sitting on the porch, you know, gossiping, going to church, telling everybody like, you know, I don't want to say anything, but I need y'all to pray for Hal because... I seen him down at the bar. You know, it was that type of town. Real, real chatty. One school, the whole that whole thing. Now, Hal and Joe actually got married right out, out of high school. Joe became pregnant when she was 17 in high school. And honey, when I tell you, it was the talk of the whole entire town. And their families were not happy about it. But they decided to get married anyways and start their own life together. It is even said that for their honeymoon, the only thing they did was like go rent a hotel room in that town to have their honeymoon. Like, oh, that's so cute. Like, hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? Now, their youngest daughter, Christy, they said was just so sweet and precious. Both of the girls were very sweet and loved in their town and just precious. But Christy, like they, they lived on this farm. Their whole entire life was the farm. They did not have much money. I mean, working on a farm is a 365 day a year. Year job. They'd never been on a vacation, never been out of the state of Ohio, living in this little town, working on the farm, living, breathing the farm, that whole type of thing. Okay. Now the little girl, Christy, they said that she would go out to the, like the field where the animals were and do her cheers. Like the animals were her friends. She loved the animals. And I could just see her out there, like with the cows, like mooing. And she's like, go, go. Like, how cute is that? Like the little chickens. And like, she's talking to the chickens. That's who she was. Now, Michelle, the older one at 17 years old, she was a little bit different. She dreamed of getting out of that town. She really wanted to go to like a college and have the whole college experience one day. But at this point in her life, it just did not look like it was going to happen. Her family did not have the money to send her to college. They, you know, they worked on the farm just to pay the bills and feed their family. Now, some drama did happen at some point when her uncle, Michelle's uncle, which was Hal's brother, the one that lives on that trailer or lived on that trailer on the dairy farm, his girlfriend went to the police, told them that he assaulted her, tied her up, assaulted her, and videotaped it. So when the cops went to his little trailer and they searched the trailer, they found these videotapes and this camera film and all that. When they went and developed it and watched it as an investigation for his girlfriend that at the time that had, you know, went and reported it, they actually found pictures of Michelle, his 17-year-old niece, tied up and blindfolded, um, and things being done to her. So when the investigation took place, it came out that Michelle's uncle that lived on that property had been assaulting her for two years. And it was terrible. When he ended up going to court, 
she ended up not testifying against him and her parents didn't make her because she, she was just too upset. She did not want to have to get up on the stand and tell everybody what had happened over and over and over again. So she actually never, she never testified against him and how the father, of course, and I can only imagine how the mother felt. Nothing against the father, but you know, I'm a mother. Like the guilt that eats you up knowing that it was on the same property that, or, you know, it, it doesn't matter where it happened, but you know what I mean? You're thinking like your uncle or her uncle, the person that, like for years, for years. And for whatever reason, she didn't tell her parents. Well, the reason was supposedly that he told her that he would kill her and she believed it. And this is a small town. You guys, this is back in you know, 1980s, no internet to realize what you can and cannot do or to ask for help. All you have are literally the people that are in front of you. That's it. So that was really hard on the whole entire family and especially Michelle. Now around 1989, and this is when Michelle was 17 and little Christy was 14, their mother, Joe, planned a vacation for them, and they planned to go to Disney World in Florida, and they were going to pack up them three and drive. And unfortunately, their father, Hal, could not come because he has to stay and work on the dairy farm. So the girls were mad, crazy excited. Okay, Disney World? I mean, who's not excited to go to Disney World today? And we can see pictures and watch videos of it, right? Like, they were so flip-flopping excited, and I could only imagine how happy their mom, Joe was to be able to take her two daughters, the road trip, you know, they were going to stop different places, sightsee, take lots of pictures, go ride rides, see Mickey Mouse, and just spend time together. And she was going to get to take her two daughters to do this. And she had never taken them anywhere before. They had never had a vacation. And again, they have never even left the state. None of them had. So they're packing up everything. They're super excited. They get in the car and they head down to Florida. Make their stops on the way. They stop to eat. They stop to take pictures and they're just having a blast together. They go to Disney World. They go to a bunch of different places while they're there and they stayed for a whole entire week. Now when the trip was getting ready to be over, they packed up everything. And of course, you know, the girls, I'm sure they were like, mom, like, oh, can we stay longer? She's like, we got to get back to the farm, you know, whatever. And they pack up and they get on the road to head back. Now, somehow, and I can only imagine with no map quest back then, honey, no Siri. All you got's a piece of paper with a bunch of lines. Some of y'all don't even know what those type of maps look like. Ugh. Joe got lost and got off track and they ended up down by Tampa instead of up <laughs> to Ohio. Now, when they realized they were in Tampa, they figured... <laughs> You know, might as well stay another day. I mean, they had to sleep, obviously. She can't drive all through the night, and she's already down there, and Tampa is beautiful. Shout out to my Tampa people. And so they just decide they're going to stay. They'll just stay the night. They'll grab something to eat. They'll look at the beach, and then they'll head back up the next day. So they stop at this gas station. Now, while Joe is pumping gas, she meets a very nice and respectful, kind man who gives her directions to a hotel, like, you know, points to turn down there, whatever. Whatever. And he writes it down on a piece of paper. This was Oba. Now, she really just kind of had a great connection with him because, you know, he asked, hey, where are y'all from? She says, we're from Ohio. Oba, I'm sure, was like, no way, me too. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Da, 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 da. What are you girls doing down here? She says, I brought my two daughters down here to go to Disney World. We're going to stay an extra day. He says to her, oh, wow, really? How about I take you guys? I do these sunset cruises where you can come get on the boat. I'll take you out to see the sunset, show you the water, all that, and I'll bring you guys back. Of course, the mother's hesitant at first, like, eh. The girls are begging, like, Mom, Mom, please, come on. We don't have anything else to do. Like, let's just do it like this. And you guys, if you've never been on, like, a sunset cruise or been on a boat when the sun's going down, like, it is, it's phenomenal. It is so beautiful. It makes you appreciate that part of our world in a whole nother way. Like, I could just imagine how excited 
that they were. So she says, oh, okay, I guess so. You know, he says, well, meet me at 7.30 at this boat ramp, writes down the directions, all that good stuff, and they decide they're going to go and meet him later. They go to the hotel, which they were staying at the Days Inn. They, uh, they take all their stuff inside. They don't even really unpack. I mean, they're only staying for the night at this point. They go out on the balcony. They take some pictures with, you know, Tampa Bay all in the background. They go down to the restaurant that the, the Days Inn has. They eat some dinner. They spend time together. And then around 7.30, Three ladies leave in the car and they drive using the directions down to the boat ramp to meet Oba to get on the boat and go see the sunset. Now, I want to point out that the girls had never been on a boat before. Okay, they're from this little town up in Ohio. They'd never been on a boat. They'd never seen a beach like this before. Okay, lakes and rivers, they're beautiful and they're nice and everything, but it's not like the ocean. The ocean is a whole nether beast. Also, none of the ladies could swim. So they were really, had to be really excited. And then also you have to think like, oh, let me just get through the story. This is another place where you're going like, why? <laughs> They get on the boat with Oba. They meet him. And they, she had written down on the paper a blue and white boat. So she knew what color boat it was. She sees the boat. They get on the boat. They ride off into the sunset. Now that was on June 1st of 1989. On June 4th of 1989, three bodies of three different women are found floating in Tampa Bay. The first body, a sailboat, was you know, sailing on the sailboat and they see off in the distance, they see something floating, they pull up to it and they realize it is a woman's body, okay? They call the police, the police come out. Not long after that, the second body, these people were standing on the pier looking over into Tampa Bay and they see a body floating and they call the police and the police are probably like, oh my gosh, oh no, they go to the second body. This was about two miles away from the first body. As they're literally pulling the second body out of the water, they get a call. About 200 yards east of the second body is a third body floating. Now, when they pull these three bodies out of the water, they notice that all of them have tape, duct tape over their mouth. Their hands are bound behind their backs. They are naked from the waist down only. And all of them had a brick, I believe it was tied around their neck, like a uh, rope. They were all tied with yellow rope around their neck, around their body or whatever, a 30 pound brick, all of them. So whoever tied them up, gagged them and did that whole thing was hoping that their bodies were going to sink. None of the women had any identification on them. And because of the warm Tampa water, what had happened was the bodies had sunk down at first, but then they become bloated as they were decomposing and the warm Tampa water kind of speeds that sped that up. And so they all floated and you can only imagine how bloated that these women's bodies had to be if a 30 pound concrete block come up with their bodies. I mean, <sighs> The police had no idea who these women's bodies were, so they started running, you know, running it on the news, asking people questions. Had anybody gone missing? Anything like that? Does anybody know who these three women could possibly be? Obviously, they don't show any faces or anything because they don't know who they are, and their bodies are already decomposing. They knew right away that there was foul play because of the tape and the tying and the brick and everything. Not long after that, the hotel manager that worked at the Days Inn Hotel called the police and said that she had a woman and two young teenage daughters check into a hotel days prior and that when the cleaning lady went into the room, she noticed that nothing had been touched. The beds were unmade and they never checked out. And so like all of their stuff is in there and they, they never got into the bed, never used anything and they never checked out. So when the cops went there, they started to, you know, search the room. They found papers, they found notes, they found different stuff, they found identification and they also found found um, camera film. And in the camera film, when they developed it, they saw the pictures of the girls on the balcony and basically their whole entire trip, which is how they could find or distinguish exactly where they had been and when they had been to those places. 
when they got a hold of Hal, the father, and Joe's husband, they asked him like where his family was, if this could be his family, and he said he really didn't have any time to check. He had been so busy with the farm. Now, I've heard conflicting stories. I've also heard that Hal did call the cops where he lived in Ohio, but either way it goes, he said that in order for him to like leave or go look or whatever, that he didn't really have time. That he said a dairy farm was 365 days a year. He had to take care of the dairy farm. Now, this set off alarm bells to the detectives okay they're always going to look at the family first whatever okay you're not even looking for your family and you don't even sound upset so they go up there to Ohio to investigate him not long after that they were able to identify the fingerprints from the bodies with the fingerprints that were in the room and confirm that yes it was Joe Michelle and Christy so at this point, again, you know, they're they're looking at the husband. So they go up to Ohio to investigate him. When they get up there, they find out the situation with the uncle. They want to investigate him, but he happened to be in jail at that time. So he was no longer a suspect, but the husband was the main suspect at this point. The more that they looked into the husband, they found that he had went out to eat every single meal that he had eaten, breakfast and dinner for sure, in his little town because he didn't know how to cook for himself. His wife always cooked. Down to even that morning, he had eaten breakfast and he had plenty of alibis, the people, honey, I told you, everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody. The people at the gas station was like, yep, that was hell. He came by here about three o'clock, filled up his tank, you know? So then they automatically knew that he was not a suspect, although they were weirded out by him because they said he did not cry at the funeral, a bunch of stuff. Eventually, they found Joe's car that was still parked at the boat launch. When they found that car, they were, they were able to search it. Now, when they searched it, they found the notes. They found the note that Oba had actually written himself. And then they also found the note where Joe had taken down directions where he, where he said where to go. So, and they also thought it was very interesting, the blue slash white. Later, they would find out it was a blue and white boat. However, at this time though, they had no real leads. So this was played on the news. Did anybody have any idea how these three women ended up tied, gagged, and with concrete blocks tied to them in three different places in the Tampa Bay? Did anybody know what happened? This blue and white, is this a blue and white boat? Does anybody know? Did anybody see them? It's all over the news. They even ran it on Unsolved Mysteries. For three years, they got tons of leads. They got an overwhelming amount of people calling in and they felt like they exhausted all of their options. There was even one guy, I believe his name was Jason, that they thought was him at first. He had a blue and white boat. He ran an unlicensed um, sunset sailing, just the same exact thing as Oba did. And he had been arrested before for assaults in certain ways. So they thought it was him for sure. He took a polygraph. He passed. He had an alibi. So they could not tie him to the murders. Now, as time did go on, a Canadian woman named Judy Blair came forward. She said that two weeks before the murders of the Rogers ladies, she went on a sunset cruise with a guy in a blue and white boat and was assaulted. She said the situation that happened with her was her and her friend were down in Tampa visiting on vacation and she met this guy, very nice, very polite, who offered to take them on a sunset cruise on the boat as well. Her friend declined. She accepted, which girl, <laughs> why would you go on a boat by yourself? But you know, it's not her fault, but huh. Again, remember you guys, there's no internet. There's nothing like that that's going to tell you. All you see is the people around you. You think everybody's pretty much nice. Back then, you think you hear about murders, but it's like so far away from anything that you know. You can't fathom that anything like that would ever happen to you. She gets on the boat with the man and she gets him at, he gets her out and he assaults her and she's begging him before he actually takes it all the way there she's begging him she's saying please i'm a virgin please don't she said that he got even more excited when she said that and he said to her if you want to live you need to do it with me and so he took her bottom half of her clothes off he did that to her and something really bizarre happened afterwards she said that he 
grabbed the side of the boat when he was finished and started puking. Now, I've heard two different theories that he would he was either so excited by the thought of her being a virgin and doing all this and raping her and all of that, that he got so excited that his body was overwhelmed and he threw up. There was also a theory that possibly he was disgusted with himself. I don't know if I believe that one because of everything else that he did. Nevertheless, he threw up. He drives her on this boat back to almost where the shore is. He tells her to jump out and swim. I'm assuming he told her to jump out and swim to shore so it would get all of the fingerprints off of her or whatever. She goes home immediately and takes a shower. Takes a shower and then she goes to the police department. There, she had already gotten rid of any of the DNA by swimming and then showering. When she saw the stuff of these three ladies and the description of the blue and white boat, she called back to the police department again and she was like, listen, this is probably, it happened two weeks. These women went missing two weeks after this happened to me. I'm convinced it's the same person. First, they call her in and they have her look at the guy that had the other blue and white boat. She said, no, 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 that's not him. She starts describing Oba and they put together a sketch. Now this sketch is going out. They're looking for him. They cannot find this person now. They did get a bunch of calls. The neighbor that lived next to Oba said, man, that looks just like my neighbor and he's sketchy and he's a little creepy. But for whatever reason, they did not. I think they got so many calls and leads that they, they could not have gotten to all of them, although they say that they did. I don't know. Nevertheless, so the investigators decided that they were going to try something different, something that they had never tried before. They took a picture of the writing that Oba had and he had left in Joe's car and they put it on a billboard and said, if you know anybody with this handwriting, because it was a very distinct handwriting, in one sentence, there was three different Ys and all three different Ys were written differently, a little bit differently, but all differently. So they put it on this billboard in hopes that somebody would pass by, recognize this kind of strange or different or unique handwriting and call in. One day, a woman drives by and she sees the billboard and she goes, that looks exactly like the receipt that I have from this guy that did aluminum work on our home. So she calls the investigator. She's like, I am convinced this is the same handwriting. She brings a receipt in. They do like forensics testing and compare it. And they realize it is an exact match to this guy. And that's Oba Chandler. They go and question Oba. Of course, he didn't do anything. He tries to provide, you know, where he was at this time. His wife is there. He is married at this time. And they're trying to figure out, they're like, listen, we cannot convict this man over his handwriting. Like we have to have more than this. They called the woman in that he had attacked two weeks prior to the Rogers girls and they have her look at picture lineup and she pulls him the very first one. Boom. That's him. No questions. That's him. And they're like, oh my gosh, we have him, but we don't have him. So they're like, we're going to call him in for a lineup. They call him in for a lineup. She's like, boom, that's him. No questions asked, but they wanted to make this stick. The piece of evidence though, however, that gave the detectives that one up so they could actually go and make an arrest on Oba was the ship to shore records. Now what had happened was the night that Oba had the ladies, the three ladies out on the bay and did everything that he had done to them. When he was finished, he called his wife from the boat to let her know that he was having boat troubles. I doubt he was having boat troubles. He probably just wanted his wife to know why he was going to be three, four hours late. He definitely didn't want to tell her because he was murdering a whole family. <sighs> and they found that he was literally out on the boat, out on the water, on the bay the same exact day. So they, they had enough evidence at this point to arrest him. They arrest him. Boom. He goes to trial. He is found guilty. The jury of 12 deliberated for 90 minutes, honey. 90 minutes. They went in there. They was like, everybody, yes? Okay, let's go. Found him guilty. And then they deliberated for 30 minutes to give him the death penalty. So they sentenced him with the death penalty. The whole entire time Oba was in prison, he denied it, denied it, denied it. He said he didn't do it. You've got the wrong man. All the way up until 2011 when he was executed in the state of Florida. Honey, Florida does not play. They still don't play. Y'all don't come down here if you want to, you know, break the law. Honey, we got people in, in prison for life for running a stop sign. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that bad, but you never know. But you know what I'm saying? 
So in 2011, where he's getting ready to be executed, he wrote a note that said, you're killing the wrong man, or you're executing the wrong man, or you've got the wrong man. I'll put the note right here. And he, when they took him to be executed, Hal was there and he was looking at him through the, you know, the plexiglass where it's a two-way mirror and he watched him be executed. And they asked him before they gave him lethal injection, is there anything that you would like to say? And he just said no and closed his eyes. Now it's so infuriating because when you are that evil of a person to do that and say, and then all the way up until the day that you're executed, continue to claim, proclaim your innocence. I think that that is, is terrible because you're still putting doubt in people's heads. Even though they feel like they have all of the evidence that you did it, you still people can go, well, what if, right? What if it's the wrong person? What if the, the person that did this was still out there? Now, in 2015, four years after Oba had been executed, a murder DNA match had come up that was 23 years old. So in 1990, a woman had went missing in her neighborhood and she was 20 years old, okay? Her body was found assaulted, SA'd, and dead in an alleyway in a neighborhood and they could never find who did it. It was gone, it was, it was unsolved for 23 years. In 2015, they had a DNA match with Oba's DNA and that woman, that 20, 20 year old woman in 1990. So not only did he do this to these three women and the other woman and God knows how many other women, he literally a year after it because he killed the, the Rogers ladies in 1989. So he, he just felt like, Oh, I got away with that. I'm going to get away. And he almost got away with the other one too. Absolutely crazy. And the worst part, one of the worst parts of this whole entire thing is when they did an autopsy on these three women, they had water in their lungs. Okay. That tells them, forensics, me, you, anybody, that they were alive when they were thrown overboard and that they, they drowned. They had water in their lungs. And when you think about what... All of them went through. And I look at it from a mother's perspective. You know, you're you're with your baby girls, okay? Your, your two daughters, you're so excited. Your first and only vacation after everything y'all had done been through with the uncle on the place and... Oh my goodness. She didn't even get, she didn't even get a vacation or a honeymoon when they got married year, two decades prior and she's taking her daughters and she just happened to take a wrong turn and end up in Tampa and wanted to take her girls out on this boat for a sun to see the sunset before she took them back to their little dairy farm. And he did not cover their eyes. So whatever he did, he allowed or made them to watch and then threw them overboard with the 30 pound bricks while they were still alive. And the youngest little girl, Christy, did manage to free one of her hands, but it just, it wasn't enough. You know, that 30 pound brick did sink them at first. They didn't, they didn't come up until their bodies were decomposing. What a horrible, horrible nightmare of a man. And this man is another one of those that looks like a regular, regular person. This literally looks like the guy that's going to show up and put your roof on, give you a quote for your fencing, just like looks like that type of guy, like a, like to me, a country boy, you know, and he did all, and there's no telling how much more stuff he did. I did see like a news, like little reporting thing where one of his daughters showed up at his execution. Though she wasn't allowed to witness the execution, a woman claiming to be one of Chandler's children came to the prison to find some kind of closure for herself. What he did and who he was does not affect me and who I am today and who I'm going to be tomorrow. So do you believe he did this? Yes, I do. So whatever he did made their daughter know, oh yeah, he was that type of person. In all of his kids, like God bless all of his kids, I sure hope nothing was heretic, like any kind of, oh, just horrible, terrible. Hal is still living, you know, up there in Ohio, hanging in there, doing you know, I guess good. I did read an article where he it said that he's working like as a mechanic. He was all dirty in the picture, just like he's just still working. And you can imagine as a man, and I know that they said he didn't cry, which everybody handles things differently. 
I cannot personally imagine losing your whole entire family at one time and not crying, but you don't know what he did in private. And you don't know what he had been through in his life that made him where he wasn't outwardly emotional like that. But still, this man lost his whole, he lost his brother before that because of the situation. And now his wife and his two girls all in one trip. Ugh. Have you guys heard about this story? I will, as always, leave some links down in the description box if you guys want to research a little bit more, see where I got some of my information from. Thank y'all so much for being here. You guys know you can stay and watch another video. Watch another one. I'll put one right here. Look, you can just watch this one. <laughs> as always, my loves, thank you so, so much for watching this video. Please do not forget to like it. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.